I'm very happy to be here, particularly with the platform and event and process associated with the memory in this instance with of K.P. Sashi, who I knew from my JNU days and again when he came back and worked in Mumbai for a while as an artist and cartoonist, political cartoonist. So I'm glad to be here and I like your theme of rediscovering India. Though there's it's obvious that there is a growing number of people in our country who have never discovered it in the first place. And re rescuing it, and you know, the, so the kind of people who've never discovered India are building an entirely obnoxious construct. And rediscovering India will mean necessarily rescuing India from what is happening. Three weeks ago, the former president of the Bajarang Dal, perhaps one of the most aggressive presidents of the Bajarang Dal, Jaiban Singh Pavaya, told The Week magazine, all of you are familiar with The Week, it comes out of Kerala, the Mandir movement is far greater and bigger than the independence and freedom movement. Yeah. Now, you can, you can dismiss it as the, you know, mumblings of an idiot, which he undoubtedly is. But 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he could not have said such a thing without being challenged. Today he can. And this was just on the eve of the orgy of January 22. Um, and then, a week ago, 10 days ago, maybe, Governor Ravi of Tamil Nadu declared that Gandhi's contribution and role in the freedom struggle was insignificant. It was Dechaji Subhash Chandra Bose who did everything. Now, here's a fantastic thing of juxtaposing figures who actually dealt with each other very differently. Here is a man, a, you know, here is a ill-read, unread person who does not know that Subhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army, who were the brigades named after? We all know Jansi, Rani of Jansi Brigade. The other brigades of the army were Gandhi Brigade. Nehru Brigade, all after his one-time comrades in the Congress party. Yeah. Now, again, oh, by the way, on 1943 from Bangkok, so Netaji Bose making a speech on Gandhi's birthday said, Never in history has one individual achieved so much in one lifetime. Now, they had great differences. That's why they broke apart. That's why they formed different political parties. But they were of a class and a generation and a mindset that dealt with difference very, very differently from the way we do today. Yeah, they could, they could completely ideologically fight the other, but never deny the other their role in history, their role in the struggle. Some years ago, and, and by the way, on January, what was I doing on January 22nd? When the Prime Minister of your nation was playing High Priest to Hindutva and in fact making the Sankaracharyas jealous. Yeah? Who many of who, who all of whom wanted to know what right he has to be doing that. That's our job. Anyway, while uh, 
and i just it's tiring to remind people you know the prime minister actually if you watch the tv coverage and i forced myself to watch some of it i saw very little of lord ram i saw a lot of lord modi you know lord modi kneeling down lord modi prostrating himself lord modi rolling over lord, lord modi oh, do, i don't know what i i i kept looking for the ram lalla he was celebrating the return from exile of ram lalla i get tired of reminding people ram lalla was not kicked out of ayodhya by babar or islam which did not exist at that time ram was thrown out of ayodhya by his flesh and blood he was kicked out by his father and his step mother now what that has to do with babar what that has to do with islam is beyond me yeah but you can write your own history now i mean it's just it's fine the difference between the differences you're seeing on these subjects on these issues is not the difference between different interpretations of history that is not true it's a difference between those who see history as a process history as an evidence based discipline and those to whom evidence is irrelevant faith triumphs everywhere evidence is irrelevant in this school of thought that is the difference it's not two historians fighting over interpretation i covered as a journalist when i was working in blitz i covered the ram janam bhoomi movement from between 80 a little after 85 till about 93 when uh, you know 92 december the demolition took place the riots took place and the greatest scandal pre adwani the greatest scandal of the uh, the great security scam rocked dalal street the stock exchange on dalal street whereupon you know one side ram janambhumi and the other side as we put it in blitz scam janam bhumi the stock exchange i have visited ayodhya several times and if you go to the ayodhya faizabad region there is not one but thousands of temples in the larger faizabad region almost every one of i mean half of them claim that ram was born here they can give you the spot marked x but they cannot tell you when because once you start trying to put a date to it you run into all kinds of problems so there are temples where ram shot his first arrow there are temples where ram no no maybe ate an apple or whatever but there are temples for every moment but there is no temple which tells you when he was born you know the exact spot the location and you built a huge thing on it on january 22nd in the people's archive of rural india we carried rabindranath tagore's poem from a 124 year old poem there is no space for god in your temple that is the poem where tagore writes of a great king who built a gigantic temple of gold almost piercing the sky and it was great effusive enthusiasm etc but after a while nobody was going there and uh, the courtiers reported to the king that they're all they're all going and listening to some old sadhu who is sitting under the branches of a tree so the king took his courtiers and went to the sadhu and he asked him oh holy one why are you sitting here in the open 
when you have got the temple my temple over there you can preach from there and the sadhu says there is no space for god in that temple and the king gets very angry he says look at it it's pure gold it's piercing the sky i built such a thing and you are saying my temple is empty the sadhu said i didn't say your temple was empty it is filled and crowded with your arrogance and pride the arrogance and pride of a king that is what your temple there is no space for god in your temple anyway the reason why governor ravi or why the bajrang dal ex president are able to say those things and get away with them is because of the near dangerously near complete erasure of our history erasure of our history there is by the way a website an official government website please compare what you saw on january 22 with how your country celebrated august 15 and january 26 is there any comparison did you get that kind of attention for one of the greatest freedom struggles humanity has seen no you didn't see that on august 15 you didn't see anything of it on january 26 republic day but you saw the most incredible celebration again it has to do with erasure the extraordinary thing about the present regime is not merely erasure of the past they are even erasing the present i'll come to that the present is being erased dramatically like how after losing millions of people in covid-19 we are now claiming to be the nation that managed covid best in the world and we are the vishwa guru you know and you know who that is for the 75th anniversary of our independence celebration of 75 years of independence the government of india put up a special website i strongly recommend you have a look at it for very different reasons than those which they had the website you know this this entire azadi ka amrut mahotsav first tranche of expenditure 110 crores no 110 crores and uh, the celebration of 75 years of independence has its logo celebrating 75 years of independence this website does not contain a single picture a single photograph a single video a single illustration a single story on by or a quote of a living freedom fighter they are still alive even in kerala there are still they don't figure in the website at all after last heroes came out i'm told they've taken two or three characters from my book and included them but they've been careful to include those characters who have died hmm. while the book was being published but not a single mention of a living freedom fighter they have one feature forgotten heroes and there are some very nice if some forgotten hero is remembered that's a good thing there are people there who i knew of there are forgotten genuinely forgotten heroes usually from uh, a long time ago no one alive there are others there are some others there who are best forgotten but not a single living freedom fighter now i'm not saying there are no photos on the website 
there are hundreds of photographs and you all know whose photographs right same photograph that appeared on every single covid 19 vaccine certificate same photograph if we are unfortunate in april may which will appear on every bus ticket in this country hmm. so this is azadi ka amrut mahotsav iresha iresha even more striking there is not a single paragraph in a huge website i mean it's you you can spend months going through it there is not a single paragraph on british colonialism and what it did to this country so you have generations who have grown up without knowing what british colonialism did yeah there is incidentally every year new emerging research on what that colonialism did but that research is not happening in indian universities in 22 november jason hickel of london and dylan sullivan of melbourne brought out an astonishing paper you know all of us during covid 19 we learned this word excess debts what is excess debts mean excess debts mean if a society has a normal number of debts each year let us say a big nation has 10 million debts a year one year it has 15 million what is the excess debt 5 million are the excess debts okay that is called excess debts you all read this phrase during the covid 19 period does anyone have a sense of what were excess debts during british rule remember those days you were a bigger country you were india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka um, not sri lanka uh, parts of burma parts of nepal this is who you were all these two researchers have done is take 40 years 1880 to 1920 why did they take 1880 the british were there from 1757 but they took those years because your first census was 1871 so from 1880 to 1921 you have comparable data guess the number of excess debts in just 40 years of british imperialism and think why you and know why your freedom fighters fought to liberate you and me from british imperialism there is a high estimate there is a low estimate and a middle estimate the general agreement or consensus 100 million excess debts the high estimate 168 million excess debts you count how many that is per second now tell me if 1% of 1% of that had occurred in a european country you would be screaming genocide right but it was all worthless brown lives right and a world which has taken erasure to such an extent that we are seeing genocide and unable to condemn it we are seeing genocide in palestine we are seeing it you are seeing genocide televised live okay and yet it doesn't move us to action you know one of the things that i am proud of and i want to tell you this about rediscovering remembrance is a very important part of it remembrance is resistance and re- there is no resistance without remembrance one of the things i remember most proudly about my country the first passport i owned in the l- first half of the 80s 
the first page said all countries except south africa and Repu republic of south africa and israel do you know that indian passports had the ban on south africa even before we became independent the interim government of nehru in 1946 placed that all countries except republic of south africa a poor country emerging from famine from hundreds of millions of deaths boycotted south africa and lost 5% of its external trade because we had a huge trade surplus with south africa you did that on morality yours was a moral position you may not have been a great nuclear power but you were a great moral power gandhi in the 30s is already condemning what is happening in palestine every single indian national leader worth his salt was condemning what was happening in palestine because they knew british imperialism they understood what british imperialism does you know i've been to 45 46 colleges and universities in the last one year for one and a half years with my book the last heroes foot soldiers of indian freedom based on the life story of living freedom fighters incidentally it has also appeared in malayalam and is available for you outside here i don't know if the english copy is available but i saw and signed the malayalam copy every you know when you have completely erased history to this extent yeah naturam godse resurfaces as a freedom fighter as a hero savarkar resurfaces as a hero now incidentally i tell you two things one about myself one about mr savarkar i was not trained as a journalist i was trained as a historian and my guide was k n panikkar my teachers were romila tapar kan panikkar bipin chandra s batacharya s gopal these were my teachers and i want, want to tell you now about something about i went from i dropped out of mphil phd and went into journalism now let me give you my understanding of mr savark i believe you know vinayak damodar savarkar was a genuine bona fide revolutionary till 1911 don't let's not also indulge in erasure of the past he was a genuine bona fide revolutionary till 1911 that's when they threw him into the andamans and all his revolutionary zeal vanished there were hundreds of others sent to andamans but he was the only one who wrote seven begging mercy petitions to the british raj spare me i will be your uh, you know advocate there were others who wrote letters asking for remission of sentence in various prisons in india but the andaman prisoners did not write mercy petitions except savarkar you know the founder the old gadar party people in punjab they would write from prison letters the founder of gurmeet singh akhlon the founder of the desh bhagat yadgar hall in jalandhar he would write these letters father dying mother crying want to go out. and within a week of being released on compassionate grounds he was bombing the british barracks in hoshiarpur railway station this was your revolutionary these were your revolution and none of them offered to collaborate with the british please read mr savarkar's letters you can see ag nurani's book where he's published five of the seven petitions are available to us they are in the national archives i don't know how long you know because you know 
somebody will invite back Savarkar from exile into the National Archives. Who knows what will happen? But that's not where it ends. I want some remembrance on this. So after sitting and spending his time writing begging mercy letters to the British, he was released. 1926, he was confined to the district of Ratnagiri. He was not house arrest. He could not leave the district. And anyway, I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry, 1926 was not the date. But in 1926, a book appeared, The Life of Barrister Savarkar. Okay, now this was authored by the pseudonym Chitragupta. Do you know who Chitragupta was historically? Chitragupta was the scribe and bookkeeper of Lord Yama. In 18th century, 19th century, lot of people used the pseudonym Chitragupta because it has authority. You know, don't listen. You don't take me seriously. You know, I am Yama's right hand man. You better watch out. So a lot of writers used this pseudonym. And there was a lot of discussion over who was this Chitragupta. Nothing came of it. The book was a terrible hagiography. It's available. Okay. It was printed by one of those Sanghi princes, printers. And in fact, it is such a eulogy, eulogy of Savarkar that uh, it gives hagiography a bad name. Hmm. Then, anyway, in 1940, uh, the book was proscribed in 1926 by the British, but in 42 it was published again. Again, the discussion over who was Chitragupta. 1986, the book is published once again, and the publisher proudly reveals from the source being none other than Savarkar's own younger brother, who reveals that Chitragupta was none other than Savarkar himself, who wrote his autobiography and presented it to the world as a biography. I went back and read it again. And I had to conclude that Mr. Savarkar had a very high opinion of Mr. Savarkar. <laughs> now this, okay, forget this. This is the, I just wanted to show you that remembrance is necessary. A nation that doesn't know where it came from has no clue where it is going. Okay? You, do, you don't know about your freedom struggle if you don't know about the incredible fights of the freedom struggle. Yeah. How people in this country sacrificed for 190 years. And your history tells you about, as if it all began in 1857 in, uh, in uh, uh, the north, long before, uh, 90 years before the first shot was fired in the north. Yeah, it starts with the Battle of Plassey and the Adivasis and Dalits of the Jungle Mahal region resisting the British for 40 years in what was wrongly known as the Chuar Rebellion. In 1790s, 80s and 90s, 60 years before a single shot was fired in the north, Tipu Sultan, Veerapandya Kattabomman, the Maruda brothers, they led and the Maruda brothers and Kattabomman actually came closest to bringing down the East India Company. Totally. This is your history. Please know it. Please remember it. Yeah? It wasn't all happening in UP and Bihar. Oh, by the way, soon I think a, a book will come from my colleague Josie Joseph, former colleague, which will tell you, I will leave you in suspense about that, 
when travancore declared its independence and secession in 48 please go back and find who was the first to congratulate them on trying to break away from the indian republic go back and see let let josie's book come and you read it please buy that book and read it uh but let's come to the erasure of the present where is where does india stand every single day you know you look at anything that happens split in the mahagat bandhan of bihar happens it is never the fault of the bharatiya janata party because the media are so completely corporatized and so completely sold out if you i can tell you this if you expect corporate media to tell you the truth you're wasting your time you're participating in the erasure please read them you need your newspaper i also need my newspaper but please read them with analytical understanding and discretion in let us look at where in what happened in covid 19 to this day can any one of you tell me what how many does any indian know i don't how many indians died of the pandemic yeah does anyone know for sure how many indians died in the pandemic we are claiming to have handled it better than anyone in the world it's like ram was born here but we can't say when ha huh, some people died but we were the best in the world we are the vishwa guru in handling it what happened let me give you what are the global estimates by institutions of advanced research and monitoring w w h o said 4.7 million indians died lancet medical journal with whom i have frequent clashes but a medical journal of some repute it said 4.2 million indians died john hopkins gave three different estimates it was running all of them in millions world development council washington dc said 4.9 million indians died of the covid-19 pandemic it also shows in various ways please remember that you know the international institute of population studies director was thrown out of his job for doing studies that questioned all the great achievements of india in life expectancy which and the nhfs the national family health survey it showed that all the figures that we are using are questionable but anyway come back to covid 19 so all these different organizations differed 4.2 4.7 but they were all agreed india lost the largest number of lives in covid 19 but vishwa guru said 4 lakh 86000 and that was it no question no newspaper no channel no one has done investigations later they revised it to 5 lakh 21000 but then you should also revise that 4.7 million into 5 million or whatever okay so complete there is something so frightening going on erasure of the past is extending to erasure of the present we are a nation living in a dangerously delusional state this is self delusion on a mass scale my friend sudesh was asking me on the way here how does the present situation compare with the uh, uh, emergency i was leader of a students union in the emergency and but down south in tamil nadu 
we did suffer as much of the north but i tell you one thing i do not remember any of us being as scared and frightened as we are today i do not remember that i do not remember my friends up north being so scared and so and i do not remember the scale of sell out of people we once respected as intellectuals people we once respected as public intellectuals of people we once respected as editors owners of newspapers the scale of that sell out which has very solid economic roots the indian press was the child of the freedom struggle the first indian owned journal to make a mark was is 202 years old now raja ram mohan roy's miratul akbar which incidentally was not in bengali it was in persian but in the last 40 years you have seen the corporatization of everything in the world including the media when the country's richest man and biggest corporate leader mukesh ambani is also the biggest owner of media in the country he owns the largest bouquet of television channels called network 18 you know when you see etv malayalam etv telugu oh sorry not telugu etv malayalam etv marathi you all think it's enadu television owned by ramoji rao no for the last 15 years it has been owned by mukesh ambani only the five telugu channels remain with inadu in telugu in andhra pradesh and telangana nowhere else all the other languages now the richest man 19th richest man in the world richest man in india rich rich biggest corporate leader is also the owner of the media and mr adani has now decided to get into that purchasing nd tv one decent channel we had and by quint and you know various other things that the entire scale apparatus of brainwashing never did you you saw many people remain silent in the emergency but the amount of crawling the amount of crawling that is happening each time mr modi speaks anything anything whatever he says is like some giant revelation of commandments or whatever that is that's where we are now so you're looking at a, what was what was the difference between the, i'll tell you for me politically the difference between the emergency and today in that regime you can say that the emergency saw the consolidation of state as authoritarian today we are seeing the emergence of state as sociopath it's astonishing it is not enough to defeat your adversary you have to humiliate him you have to heap cruelty on them you have to take great pleasure in humiliating and destroying your enemy even after defeating him how many people are in jail for no reason other than they criticize mr modi or mr adani yeah i think it's a very frightening i think it's a very frightening situation so back to covid 19 yeah so in covid 19 for instance and there's one thing involving kerala there on march 31st 2020 the attorney general of india gave an affidavit in supreme court march 20, 31 that is a week after the lockdown is declared as of today i can state that there is not a single migrant left on the highways okay not a single migrant left on the highways my friends the largest 
movement of human beings in recorded history happened at that time i can show you how many and uh, i can give you a glimpse of how many people moved we were the ones that covered it in the people's archive of rural india anyway on march 31st attorney general says not a single migrant on the highways Le- as of 11:30 this morning as of 11 am this morning april 14 the same attorney general appears before the same innocent supreme court bench and says governments plural have opened 23573 relief centers food and relief centers across the country for he did not mention that 62% of those relief centers were opened in the single state of kerala 62% were opened just in kerala by governmental non governmental yeah and he did not mention at all numbers of how many were in up bihar and other places dominated by the ruling party yeah do you know then again they try bringing being quiet but the numbers are moving millions of people walked hundreds of kilometers to reach home rather than stay in the cities the media beat its chest in anguish and said why are they leaving there's a better chance of survival in the city better chance of medical help why are they leaving that was the wrong question the real question and brings me to erasure of the present the real question was not why they were leaving the cities and going back to the villages the real question was why did they leave the villages and come here in the first place and the answer to that was two words agrarian crisis tens of millions of people whose livelihoods were destroyed by the increasing corporatization of agriculture came skilled farmers worked as your cook or my driver yeah and that's why we were so unhappy to see them go cheap labor going hmm? but the railways gave away the game they started the special shramik trains remember the shramik trains to transport labor already millions of people have moved when on may 1st labor day the indian railways introduces shramik trains on may 26th the indian railways give on may 26th the indian railways put out a press release and i am proud of the indian railways they claimed and i am proud of them in 25 days between may 21 and may 25 the railways transported they tra- they transported 91 lakh workers on the shramik trains that means almost 1 crore in 25 days but please remember there was march and april before that when people went by foot when people went by any means they could not less than 20 million human beings left their places of work and residence and the nrgs nearly collapses with the additional load hmm. they have to put another 20 40 thousand crores in it but there's no discussion about this there is absolutely no and there is no discussion about the agrarian crisis now more than 400000 farmers have taken their own lives since 1995 and those are official figures they are huge underestimates like not a single migrant is on the streets today hmm? and also remembrance is resistance rediscover what happened in did your media tell you that what happened that farmers kisan andolan the farmer struggle 
the farmer's struggle in at the gates of delhi was the single greatest largest peaceful constitutional democratic protest the world has seen in 25 years prior to that the most famous global struggle for justice was 2011 occupy wall street occupy wall street a few thousand young idealistic americans occupied zucotti park a privately owned park in new york on wall street and they put out slogans we are the 99% you are the 1% yeah it was a great slogan it was a great fight but at the end of 9 weeks the new york mayor decided throw them out even though the owner of the park was not saying anything the man who owned zucotti park did not ask for them to be thrown out yeah but it took nypd 10 12 hours to throw everybody out of there 24 hours they cleaned it out your farmers lasted 53 weeks at the gate of the capital attacked not just by police but by cisf crpf uh, <laughs> when i went there many times it looked like there was a greater mobilization to fight your farmers than you would find on the line of actual control with china yeah 20 foot by 10 foot trenches in the national highways dug by your government in violation of their own law or destruction of public property thousands of feet of barbed wire the worst winter in 40 years water cannon freezing cold water hitting old men sometimes in their 80s who died of hypothermia all this happening there your farmers did not budge they represent they re- please know this not only was that the greatest democratic protest far greater than occupy wall street they fought for you and me because can any one of you tell me that your media that your mainstream media can you name a channel can you name a magazine can you name a newspaper or a portal that carried the full text of the three farm laws full text of the three farm laws if you read the text if you read the text you will find that the farm laws were not only against farmers they were against every one of us they re- the specific clause removed the fundamental right 32 of the indian constitution the right to legal remedy which is one of the three most important rights in a democracy the right to legal redress which made the supreme court of india one of the most powerful supreme courts in the world that clause 17 of 14 states categorically this law is outside the beyond is outside the jurisdiction of the civil courts it would instead go to some appellate tribunal headed by deputy collector tehsildar who are all going to eager to fight ambani and adani huh? the farmers 720 of them died according to the samyukt kisan morcha's last estimate they fought for you my friends they fought for me yeah don't let us forget them and on that brings me to an appeal i make to all of you on 16th february 12 days from now there is going to be because the farm laws are being reintroduced through the back door by the way the farm laws many of after they were defeated and withdrawn only then did the farmers leave they were not thrown out they refused to be thrown out 720 died but please know this those clauses from those laws have been introduced through the back door in many other laws including in the anti cow slaughter law it's an interesting thing for people in uh, kerala should know incidentally i believe i believe the best uh, 
beef in the world that I have eaten is in Kerala. Mm. And I try never, I never visit and not have it. Okay. Uh, please bear that in, night for, put in mind for tonight. Yeah. So, uh, in, the, in the Karnataka anti-cow slaughter law, what did they do? They have put a clause there from an old colonial thing. They have put a clause that those acting in good faith under this law might be deemed to be public servants. So, I take a gang and raid Aflak Khan's house, lynch him, torture his family and say there was beef in the, I believe there was beef in their freeze. I am acting in good faith. I can be declared a public servant. It actually uses the word. Can be. It's an old colonial thing for collaborators. This clause was written for your Bajrang Dal and VHP. I mean, reintroduced for them. It's still there on the Karnataka law. Okay. So, what? it was introduced as an ordinance and then made a law. So, this sort of a thing. You know, we... Every January 25th, all of us, June 25th, we gather in remembrance of the emergency and signify our rejection of the emergency. But every year, we institutionalize our embrace of the emergency with new laws, with new acts, with new curbs on freedoms. The farmers fought for that. Another group that fought for it the farmers showed us the meaning of the word resistance. That they showed us. And they were the ones who showed us that in 1857 as well. It was not a sepoy mutiny. It was the greatest agrarian uprising the world had seen. Even, see, it was not the people of Lucknow, citizens of Lucknow, Kanpur and Meerut who revolted. It was the soldiers in the cantonment. Who were the soldiers? Then and today, please know, the Indian Jawan is a Kisan in uniform. He has to reflect the mood of the village. At that time, the land, re the land actions taken, undertaken by the British dispossessed millions of, even the Nawabs were dispossessed in Ninawad. Many of them were dispossessed of land and fought it. Yeah. And that led to your uprising because of the famines and the millions of deaths that followed. So guys, friends, I'm asking you to remember memory is the weapon. Remembrance is resistance. Rediscovery means rescuing a country which is supposed to be doing so fabulously, but India has fallen to 111 out of 121 nations in the global hunger index. The hungriest number of, largest number of hungry people in the world. India has fallen to rank 161 out of 180 countries in the world press freedom index. India has fallen to 132 out of 100 and out of 132 out of 188 nations in the United Nations Human Development Index. In the Environmental Performance Index, India in 2022 fell to 180 out of 180. But on one index we are top. And that's what I want filmmakers, artists, look. The great, the thing, the power of poets, artists, filmmakers is, is, inc is incalculable. It may be intangible. But in five verses, a poet can say more than an academic in five volumes. So too with filmmakers and documentary makers who in half an hour to one hour can pack something that can absolutely set a nation thinking 
enacting. Yeah, we need that remembrance. We need that. We need that. Is the process of rediscovery? I ask you to make. <laughs>